The conscious overestimation of the interest in consumption over that in production has its origin in the predominance of agrarian production. Landed property, the relatively safe possession protected by law, was the only possession that could guarantee for the Greeks the continuity and unity of their awareness for life. In this respect, the Greeks were still Orientals, in that they conceived the continuity of life only if the fleetingness of time was supplemented by a solid and constant content. It is thus the adherence to the concept of substance that characterizes the whole of Greek philosophy. This does not at all characterize the reality of Greek life, but rather its failures, its longing and its salvation. It reflects the tremendous scope of the Greek mind in that it not only sought its ideals in the extension and completion of the given, as happened with lesser-spirited people, but further reflected this scope in their attempt to complete their passionately endangered reality, always disrupted by party strife, in another realm, in the secure bounds and quiet forms of their thoughts and creations. The modern view, in total contrast, views the unity and coherence of life in the interplay of forces and the law-like sequence of moments that vary their content to the utmost. The whole diversity and motion of our life does not dispose of the feeling of unity, at least not usually, and then only in cases where we ourselves perceive deviations or deficiencies, on the contrary, life is sustained by it and brought to fullest consciousness by it. This dynamic unity was foreign to the Greeks. The same basic trait that allowed their aesthetic ideals to culminate in their forms of architecture and plastic arts and that led their view of life to be one of a limited and finite cosmos and the rejection of infinity, this trait allowed them to recognize the continuity of existence only as something substantial, as resting upon, and realized in, landed property, whereas the modern view of life rests upon money whose nature is fluctuating and which presents the identity of essence in the greatest and most changing variety of equivalents. Moreover, commercial transactions based on money were further discredited in the eyes of the Greeks by the fact that such transactions are always somewhat long-sighted and operate on the calculability of the future. Yet to the Greeks the future was, in principle, something unpredictable, Hope for the future was extremely delusive, even presumptuous, and such insight might provoke the wrath of the gods. All these internal and external moments of life formation interact in such a way that one cannot designate any one of them as the unconditional fundamental one. The character of an agrarian economy is determined, on the one hand, by its reliability, by a small and less variable number of intermediate links by the emphasis on consumption rather than production, and on the other by an attitude focused on the substance of things, and by an aversion to the unpredictable, the unstable, and the dynamic. On the one hand, all these qualities are various broken rays of a unified historical basic formation refracted by the medium of differentiated interests. We cannot directly grasp or name these rays with the dissecting mind. Perhaps they belong to those formations to which the question of priority is not applicable, because their essence basically rests upon the interaction of mutual dependence in an infinite process and in a circle that is defective as to the knowledge of the details, but essential and unavoidable in its basic motives. No matter how we interpret it, the fact remains that, for the Greeks, the ends and means of the economy had not drifted so far apart as they did later further, that the means had not the same psychological independent existence and that money had not developed so obviously and without inner resistance into an independent value. Psychological consequences of money's teleological position, the importance of money as the outstanding and most perfect example of the psychological raising of means to ends becomes most apparent when the relationship between means and ends is inspected more closely. I have already mentioned a number of occasions in which we hide the real goals of our actions from ourselves, so that our will is in reality focused on goals other than we ourselves assume. Thus, it seems legitimate to search further. For purposes, beyond those reflected by our consciousness, but where does the limit to our search lie? 
If the teleological sequence does not terminate in the last consciously conceived link, then does that not open up the way to its continuation to the infinite? Is it not then necessary to be dissatisfied with any given purpose on which our action rests, and to search for a further reason for it and a purpose beyond the acknowledged one? In addition, no gain or condition attained grants us the final satisfaction which is logically bound up with the concept of an ultimate purpose. Rather, every point arrived at is actually experienced as only a transitional stage to a definitive one, both in the realm of the senses, because it is in constant flux and every enjoyment is followed by a new need, and in the realm of the ideal, because the demands are never fully met by empirical reality. To summarize, it appears as if what we call the ultimate purpose is floating above the teleological sequence yet stands in the same relation to the horizon as the earthly paths that always lead towards it, yet which, after the longest wanderings, never seem to be any closer than at the outset. The question is not whether the ultimate purpose can be attained, but whether its form of presentation may be given any content. The teleological sequences, to the extent that they are directed towards what can be realized in this world, come to a standstill not with their realization, but rather in accordance with their inner structure. Instead of the fixed point that each of them seems to have in its ultimate purpose, only the following heuristic regulated principle is offered, namely, that one should not consider any individually willed goal as the final one, but that one should leave the possibility open for a step to a higher purpose. In other words, the ultimate purpose is only a function or a request. Viewed as a concept, it is nothing other than the condensation of the fact that at first it seemed to nullify, that the path of human endeavor and valuation leads to infinity and that no points reached on that path can, in retrospect, escape being considered as a mere means, no matter how much it appeared to be definite before it was reached. The elevation of the means to the dignity of an ultimate purpose thereby becomes a much less irrational category. Certainly in the individual case, irrationality cannot be eliminated, but the nature of the totality of teleological sequences differs from that of the limited phases. That the means become ends is justified by the fact that, in the last analysis, ends are only means. Out of the endless series of possible volitions, self-developing actions, and satisfactions, we almost arbitrarily designate one moment as the ultimate end, for which everything preceding it is only a means, whereas an objective observer or later even we ourselves have to posit for the future the genuinely effective and valid purposes without their being secured against a similar fate. At this point of extreme tension between the relativity of our endeavors and the absoluteness of the idea of a final purpose, money again becomes significant and a previous suggestion is developed further. As the expression and equivalent of the value of things, and at the same time as a pure means and an indifferent transitional stage, money symbolizes the established fact that the values for which we strive and which we experience are ultimately revealed to be means and temporary entities. In so far as the most sublimated means of life become the most sublimated purposes of life for most people, it forms the most unambiguous evidence that whether a teleological moment will be interpreted as a means or as an end depends only on one standpoint, a proof whose extreme decisiveness corresponds to the completeness of a test case.